He is, of course, the one and only Ken Flo on the program. Kenny Florian, where have you been? There he is, Kenny. Long time. What's up, dude? It's been way wow. too long. How you been? You just talking to me like that is like putting me back in a different time, like 2012. <laughs> you sitting next to I should be asking you for some kind of report. Right <laughs> I know, now. right, right. So Let's go should... inside the octagon with Aria. <laughs> oh my God, where's Todd Harris when you need him? Um, <laughs> gosh, Kenny, that is crazy. How, everything good? Long time. I don't even know everything the last time is... I spoke to you. I can't even remember. I know it's been a while, dude. I. Everything is great, thankfully. Everything is awesome. Uh, and uh, it's great to hear your voice. Good to see you. And yeah, I guess what? It's probably been, I don't know, four or five years since we last yes. talked on, on your show. So yeah, man. Well, I'm so happy that you're back and I'm happy that everything is going well. Could I ask, by the way, and, and I'm going to get into why you're here because you sent me a, a tweet uh, last week and I was like, <laughs> yeah. you know what? I A, would like to take you up on that, but B, I'd love to have you back on the show. Um, why don't why don't we see you on those UFC broadcasts, Kenny? This is a travesty. What you know, I was going to get yeah. right into it. What is going on here? You're one of the very best. I don't get it. Thank you, thank you, man. I appreciate that. Um, I guess um, my understanding. I, I don't know. You know, this is what's been told to me from people. You know, I guess inside the company. But I guess I said no to um, being a coach on. Um, one of the ultimate, I was, I was asked to be a coach. I think it was ultimate fighter, Latin America. One of the early ones from really? back in the day. I never knew that. And yeah. And, and I, I wasn't able to do it. I mean, it was like travel and all that stuff. And I, you know, I was doing UFC tonight. I was doing, you know, commentary work and, um, you know, just had a lot of stuff going on at home. So I just wasn't able uh, to really do it. Um, and it, it just kind of didn't make sense. And apparently because I said, no, uh, I started kind of slowly being removed from uh, stuff. That that's that's my understanding. Uh, that's what's been told to me. Um, you know, not not directly, but people within the company, I guess, who who are close to the source. Um, so I guess that that's how it went down. Um, and yeah, uh, you know, so I stopped doing that. And um, I guess last year uh, started doing stuff for for the PFL, which has been awesome. Been great to call fights again and, and be in that energy and, and right up uh, close to the cage again. So um, that's, that's been a lot of fun, but uh, of course, you know, I watch everything. I, I watch all the fights. I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, all the big fights that they have and all the different organizations. And I try to stay uh, as close to the action as possible. And, and um, you know, st still doing my thing with John Anik, of course, on the Anik and Florian podcast. And uh, yeah. Do you regret that decision? Like, do you wish you could do it over? I, you know, I, I think if someone called me directly and was like, hey, please, can you can you just do this? And and I, I, I probably would have done it. You know, I, I've I've always done my best to, you know, keep keep the people who are employing me as happy as possible. And and, um, you know, it. I, 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 I don't have any regrets. You know, I try I try not <laughs> to uh, look back on things and say, ah, I wish uh, you know, things, things happen for the best. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy where I am right now. So, um, things are good. Things are good. Why did it take so long for another organization to sign you or, or was that your call? Um, I don't know. I, I guess I kind of, uh, was laying low for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I, I, luckily I was in, at the standpoint where I, I would have preferred to be working, but I guess I was at a point where, you know, I had my other business. Um, I had a jujitsu business in, in Los Angeles for, for a time. And, um, was doing that and, and kind of just getting into other things. So luckily I, I wasn't in a spot where I had had to work. I would have preferred to, but um, yeah, I, I kind of just waited and, and was kind of was seeing what was going to happen with the transition and everything. And when that seemed like that wasn't coming to fruition, um, I decided to, well, let's, let's go into other things. And, you know, the PFL contacted me, um, I guess in 2019, and, um, and we ended up, you know, making it happen. Obviously things were kind of delayed a little bit with COVID, right. but then we, 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 we had a chance to make it happen, uh, last year. Safe to assume you'll be back this season with PFL. Yes. Yeah, I will. Okay. I will. We, yeah, we, and we get things started, uh, in February, the middle of February, um, you know, with the challenger series, which, which should be pretty cool. And then, uh, and then the regular season starts in April. So yeah, we will get getting ready to get, uh, ramped up here. Okay, great. Um, I want to ask you a few things, and you have your your podcast with John Anik, which you guys have been yes. doing now for, I mean, almost a decade as well. How long have you been doing yeah. that show together? Yeah, so right? geez, uh, I guess 
six years now. Wow. Okay. Six, seven years. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I would presume that comes out today as well, too, right? To- it does. It does. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Obviously, a, a lot to talk about yes. this weekend. <laughs> uh, I, I see. You know, you're you're always very active on Fight Night, and I appreciate that about you because I think some people actually might be a little, uh, I don't know, jaded. You know, things kind of go sour. You maybe not. I don't know. Maybe there was a point where you were not watching the sport or taking a break from the sport. I, I wouldn't blame you, honestly. Was there a point where you <laughs> took a break, or are you still you're not, still not really? No, not really. I mean, I, I'm not. Maybe there was a time where I wasn't um as vocal on social media about it yeah but um you know, cert- certainly was watching uh and paying attention you know i i am uh, i still try to practice martial arts as much as possible i still try to learn as much as possible and enjoy watching uh obviously high level uh fighting so i try to watch as much as i can as much as i can consume and learn as much as i can so uh probably more for selfish reasons than anything else but uh still still watching yeah never never really stopped the the great thing about this sport is I, i think mma as much as i love it of all the major sports out there including combat sports uh does probably the worst job of honoring its legends, its its forefathers, of reminding people who was who in this sport, right? And I even see you on Twitter, like there's people, Joe Blow in his basement questioning your thoughts on this guy. Like, and I'm wondering, does this guy even know who Kenny Florian is? Like, does he even remember who the F this guy was, right? Does, that's gotta <laughs> drive you nuts. I saw you going back and forth with something like, yeah, dude, okay, uh, you're probably right. Like, uh, I think it was about the grappling in, in the heavyweight. Like, yeah, yeah. does that not drive yeah. you insane? <laughs> it's funny. Well, we live in insane times. Yes, you know? that is true. Uh, so <laughs> everything's backwards. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's funny. I I, I honestly, I, I I laugh a lot more about it than I I probably did when I was younger. Uh, I think uh, I, I I would take it more seriously now. You know, I I think people um, don't know what they don't know, and and I think uh, it, it seems like the people that don't really know much are are kind of uh, the most vocal on social media <laughs> and talking about this and criticizing this and that. So. Having seen that, I uh, I kind of just laugh about it uh, now. And there, there, there's a lot of them out there, man. It's Jeez. hard. I, you know, the, my my friend has been the block button over the years. I just like, you know, after a while, it's like, eh, just enough. It's it's just like easier. Yeah. So I, I do want to pick your professional brain if I can for a second uh, about the heavyweight uh, title fight, Francis Ngannou Cyril Gan. Yeah. You tweeted this. If we could put this uh, tweet up here about this fight, which I, I wanted to get your take as to why you said two dangerous heavyweights in the main event, but this grappling and decision making on the ground is cringy. So what was cringy <laughs> about it? So I would say this. So there was a lot of mistakes back and forth. You know, I think the 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 cringiest, if you know. Um, if I could use that word, I guess, was Cyril gone going for that leg lock, which mm-hmm. was really unwarranted. You know, like it's funny. And and listen, I, I've certainly been there, right? Where it's like you do one stupid thing and you're like, man, that that may have shifted the fight completely. And it came down to that fifth and final round, you know, on, on two out of the three judges scorecards anyway, where it was even gone was on top. And instead of, you know, staying on top, chipping away with ground and pound or looking for, you know, better position uh, from the top. He decided to go for that leg lock, which allowed Francis to get on top. And it was kind of like, you know, a lot of, you know, poor decision making, I think. Um, And, you know, just some mismanaged positioning uh, by both men there. And listen, both guys are not known for their grappling skills. And, um, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get the win. So many times in combat, it isn't pretty and it isn't beautiful. Both those guys are absolute savages when it comes to the striking. Um, and the fact that it wasn't decided on on the feet um, was a little, little bit surprising, I think, to a lot of people, myself included. And I think that, um, you know, yeah, sure, Francis, we've seen some takedowns and stuff like that maybe in the past, not a whole lot. But to say that, you know, if I told you before the fight that he was going to utilize his grappling um, and and ground game to win the fight, I think a lot of people would say, well, you're crazy. Uh, But I I think it almost makes that impressive as well. So while I was a little critical of some of the techniques or maybe some of the execution, it's still impressive that Francis, who is known for his power and his striking, was able to get it done. And I think once he saw that, he could expose the lack of grappling skills from gone and get that top position. He just kept hammering that home, which is 
really what he should have done. So um, while I was critical of that, I'm, I'm still praising the fact that he, he brought a skill that we haven't really seen from him to win the fight. And that was really cool. And when you compound that with the pressure, the contract dispute, you know, the badly injured knee, all that stuff, it's like, man, he's a savage. Um, so props to Nganu for getting it done. Tech, I know he's not a black belt or anything like that, far from it, but yeah. technically on the ground, was there anything that Francis did that you were actually like, all right, good job, big man? Yeah, you know, I, well, you know, obviously there was the takedowns that I was impressed with, but I think, you know, the fact that he was staying composed uh, down there and, and he was keeping his head in the right spot, keeping gone as pinned as he could uh, from that back position. Um, almost got the back a couple times. I like that transition, how fast he was trying to get to the back, wasn't able to complete it. Um, but you know, physically he's, that's never been a problem. He still moves extremely well. He's like a cat out there. Um, but he'll get better, you know, and, and he's working on it. That was clear. And, um, you know, no matter where you are in your mixed martial arts career, there's always going to be some weaknesses. I mean, the game is just, there's so much to learn. It is so vast. Um, but I think once, you know, those weaknesses are filled in over time, Francis is just going to be that much better. What do you think happens with this whole contract thing? I mean, this is as someone, you know, you've been in there, you know what it's like. You were there when the sport exploded with the ultimate fighter. This is so rare, right? To see the, the champion, especially the heavyweight champion go into this territory, last fight of his deal. Now he wins, he has the belt, he has the leverage. Of course, we know they could just take the belt away from him, right? I mean, it's theirs. They could just be like, boop, we're going to do a, a vacant title fight. How do you think this plays out? Gosh, you know, uh, listen, I, I think that uh, for Francis, he did everything possible for the most part um, to to get the to get the contract that he wants or to, to have the negotiation negotiations go his way so he does have some leverage obviously getting a win than he would have if he got the loss now the other side of it right is the business side of things it's like from what i hear i don't know if it was the biggest pay-per-view in the world so you know there's going to be the two conflicting things it's like how many pay-per-view buys did he bring in um versus you know his performance in there defending the belt. What I think you need to take into consideration again is the fact that, I mean, how many champions would have, would have continued uh, with that fight who would have followed through and actually fought with, you know, potential what I'm hearing, you know, uh, maybe a, a, you know, an injured ACL or, or a torn ACL, MCL, whatever it is, and still fought, you know, there was a lot on the line. He continued to do it um, and, and fought, you know, the best that he could. So, I think that that bodes well for him. Um, and I, I think a lot of people still want to see him fight. Uh, and, and I hope the pay-per-view buys, um, you know, are as good as possible for Francis' sake. I think as far as getting a guy who's humble, who, who is exciting, who has had a lot of great knockouts, who will probably continue to get a lot of great knockouts and improve as a fighter, I think he's a guy that that should be re-signed and should be paid what he deserves. Um and, and Cyril Gaunt certainly has that potential as well. So uh, I, I hope they re-sign him. I, I hope it works out for Francis. Um, and if not, maybe he comes over to the PFL. Yes, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> can Francis Ngannou at 100% healthy, no knee issues, can he hang with Tyson Fury in a boxing match, in your opinion? You know, as far as boxing skill, Tyson Fury is one of the best heavyweight boxers I've seen uh, fight and compete. You know, he moves so well. He's so light on his feet. He's so experienced. He's got a chin from hell. Um, that that would be a really tough fight for Francis Ngannou, obviously, and, and not to mention Tyson's size. You know, it, there, there's big people out there, and Ngannou is extremely powerful and is capable of probably knocking out any human on the planet. But Tyson has shown uh, the ability to withstand punishment and evade uh, strikes really well. For such a large guy, he moves so well. Um, I, I think it would be a really tough fight for him. Now, as far as a payday, like that could be a one and done payday where Francis goes in there, he fights once, and maybe we don't see him again. Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I guess it really depends on what his motivation is. Is he trying to make the most amount of money? Um, you know, he's 35 years old. You know, how many more years does he have left? Or is he trying to build, you know, the best MMA legacy that he can? Um, I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's mutually, mutually exclusive. Maybe it is. I don't know. 
But um, I, I guess that's for him and his team to figure out, um, you know, going out as, as champion also not a, not a bad way to go out. If he chooses to do so, it was a short career. I would love to see him fight uh, more, but um, you know, I, I think as fighters, as businessmen as well, we're trying to optimize the amount of energy that we're putting into things to get the most amount of value. Right. And as we talk about Bitcoin later, hopefully we could talk a little bit more about that, but it's like, if I'm going to compete for a set amount of time, and I am sacrificing my mind and body to do so, I want to make sure that I'm making the most amount of money that I can. I need to preserve that for my future, for my family, for my kids, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I, I think uh, you know, for, it's for Francis to decide on, on what's going to be the best approach here as he moves forward. I, I think it's a great situation that Tyson Fury is actually out there yeah. calling for that fight. So I think it it's going to help him in whatever negotiation um, you know, he decides whatever direction he decides to head in as far as negotiation, whether it's boxing or MMA. Uh, last thing before the Bitcoin uh, conversation, uh, our old friend DC texted me after the fight and he said, and you know how hard it is for him to admit this. He said, John Jones beats Francis. I couldn't disagree more. I don't, I don't think, I mean, you have to remember the knee. He wasn't at hundred percent. What do you think? John Jones at heavyweight. We've never seen him at heavyweight against big Francis yeah. who wins. Well, listen, I, I think that was a, uh, I would agree with DC, uh, Ariel, to be honest. I think that, you know, given the skill set, given the experience that John Jones has, you know, the, all the different ways that he has won in the past. Now, we haven't seen him at heavyweight. And, you know, the, the power of Francis Ngannou is a real thing. That is something to be feared and something to, res to be respected. But I just think John Jones is the more skillful guy. Um, and, I think that ha him being in all of those big fights and him also being motivated by great challenges, I always think that's when we see the best John Jones. I uh, I, I fully agree with DC. Um, I, I do think that John Jones could go in there and, and become the heavyweight champion in his very next fight, if that's the direction right. that they head. So, yeah, John Jones is a problem, man. And he's especially a problem when he feels... Um, like he's got a big challenge in front of him. I think that's when he rises to the occasion. And while we haven't seen him in a long time uh, and he's had his issues outside of the octagon, I, until proven otherwise, you know, John Jones is still the, the greatest uh, or if not one of the greatest to, to do it out there. And he's had some lackadaisical, you know, performances, but they're wins nonetheless. Uh, I just think he, he really wasn't motivated fighting at 205 pounds anymore. Um, but I think at heavyweight, he does feel that, that that sense of um, I, I guess that challenge again. So uh, early last week, I report that Francis is going to convert half his purse into Bitcoin. When you say Bitcoin to me, I have no idea. Like I see it everywhere. I see you tweeting. I see Ben Askren yes. tweeting, and I like please. I don't even. I, it's too much for my feeble brain to understand. And yet, it seems like the Bitcoin uh, believers are just so passionate about this and 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 like and they love talking and i give you guys respect why is this a smart thing for <laughs> francis to do because by the way amazingly last night i want to mention this to you i saw this on uh on the ticker if you will odell beckham jr announced he would receive seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars of his Rams salary when he signed with the la rams in bitcoin back in november according to this source this is from darren Ravel. he tweeted if Odell cashed out his Bitcoin position today, he would net 35,703 after taxes due to the Bitcoin dip. How is this a good idea? <laughs> right. Well, here's the thing. There's a lot to this, Ariel. And you do not have a feeble mind. I know you're a <laughs> smart guy. And and, and it, it does take time to wrap your head around Bitcoin. It really does. And it, it has taken me a long time. I've been in this space, I guess, since like 2016, 2017. But um, I learn more every single day. You know, it's kind of like mixed martial arts. There's so much to it. But all right. So, you know, I think it comes down to um you know, value, like what is your perceived value and what is the long-term, um, you know, potential of that value? When, when you look at Bitcoin, Bitcoin basically is this decentralized network of value. Um, and people have been putting their money into this network because, uh, 
you know, it's the decentralization that gives it value. You know, right now, our money is tied to the Fed. It's tied to the government. Right now, we've been uh, printing an insane amount of money. And if you could wrap your head around this a little bit, um, I think in the last 22 months, last two years, uh, the United States, for example, has printed um, 80% of all dollars in existence. So, that's, you know, we've gone from, I guess, a $4 trillion debt in January 2020 to a $20 trillion debt in October 21. So what is a trillion dollars? If you spent $1 million a day, you would have to get to 2,800 years to spend $1 trillion. Wow. So as you're, as you're printing that money, what happens is the value of your money goes down. So if you're you know, working your, your ass off in whatever job it is, football, MMA, you know, uh, podcasting, announcing, whatever it is, you know, that value that you made last year is way less than it is this year. And if you notice, everything is going up in price, gas, food, you know, I know you have kids like clothing, everything is get, everything is getting more expensive. Now with Bitcoin, there is volatility. Absolutely. There's been a big dip, um, uh, lately, Bitcoin is kind of known for these dips. And I guess the best way I could equate it to is that when you get a new life form, when you get this new uh, type of money, there's always going to be volatility. It's like Amazon in the early years or Google in the early years. Everyone's like, what is this internet thing? What is, is the internet even going to be a thing? Well, it is. And Bitcoin was one of those ways that was designed to deliver value over the internet and for it to not be uh, messed with by other people, right? So there's no CEO of Bitcoin. There's no marketing department of Bitcoin. It's like this decentralized network all over the world, which means like there's node operators all over the world. There's miners. Uh, and uh, people are finding that because the government has been, I guess, entrenched in printing more money, um, that they feel like this is a network is the first time that we've created money that is separate from state. Mm. Um, and the cool thing about it is that it can be sent instantaneously. Now there, there's a, a layer above the Bitcoin network called the lightning network where I can send you, you know, millions of dollars in, you know, a second um, without interruption. Whereas, you know, I had a, I had a jujitsu, uh, you know, I have a jujitsu Academy and, you know, I have to contact, you know, the factory in Pakistan and then wire money from my bank. So th there's the whole approval from the bank. The bank will charge me for uh, that wire fee. I need to ask for permission. And a week later, they wire the money and I'm finally able to get that business transaction going. Bitcoin operates so quickly and so efficiently. And that's just the way things head to. Everything trends towards um, operations being done or executed more efficiently and more quickly. And when you see it now, we could say, well, right now it's dipping. Well, what happens when everyone starts adopting this? What happens when everyone really starts getting on board? And we're seeing huge businesses, I mean, huge financial um, companies like Fidelity, uh, Mass Mutual, um, you know, JP Morgan, even all these banks all over the world now are adopting Bitcoin, uh, Visa, MasterCard are getting on board. So when you're seeing this early adoption, there's going to be volatility. But long term, I think if you're looking for ways to preserve your value, uh, as opposed to going in and, and maybe gambling in the stock market or whatever. Um, you know, I, I think this is something that is going to be worthwhile for a lot of people. You know, you see Tom Brady talking about it, Odell Beckham, like you mentioned, Russell O'Kong. I mean, there's so many guys that are all about it. Um, I, I think that it's only a matter of time. And uh, I, I think it's something that is truly going to change the world. And, you know, Francis Ngannou, um, being from Africa, you know, there's a lot of countries where, you know, their currencies have been manipulated and been inflated like thousands of percent. So imagine, you know, going in with literally a duffel bag of money to go buy milk and eggs. Like it, that's what's happening. And you look at it in countries like Argentina and Venezuela, I have cousins in Venezuela where things are getting inflated so much where the money that they had before isn't worth what it used to be. And, you know, I guess the, the recent inflation rate that was just reported in the United States was 7% this month. I believe it probably doubled that. But anyways, it, it, it was you know reported that the inflation rate, it keeps going up and up and up. 
Um, and we're in a tough situation right now. You know, obviously the pandemic was kind of this perfect storm where the government had to step in, but the government stepping in has only kind of made uh, things worse. So um, Bitcoin for me is kind of that thing that is going to change a lot about how businesses are run, how people perceive value. Um, and uh, I think there's going to be a, lo- a lot of long-term benefits uh, for individuals, businesses, and countries. Wow. Okay. I love it. Again, I love the passion. Um, would you advocate for more fighters? Um, and we you know we talk about fighter pay. They don't get what they deserve. Blah, yep. blah, blah. Would you advocate for more fighters to do what Francis did? I think so. Especially now, like, you know, um, you buy when there's a lot of fear and, and you, and you know, when people are all about it, like when they see the price going up and it's at their highest, that's when people are like, all right, I got to buy in. That's almost the wrong right. time to do it. When it's really low is the time to buy. Right. And um, we've seen these, you know, huge dips in Bitcoin before and only to like rise a hundred X from there. So yeah, I do. I think here's the way I, I always tell people about Bitcoin, view it as your savings account. Don't view it as like, oh, this is my time to like cash out in a year or six months or three months. Like that's you don't want to be a day trader. That's too difficult and, and too, you know, hard to do. Um, l- see it as long-term savings. And if you are, you know, I, I know so many fighters, Ariel, that like, you know, they don't have retirement plans. They don't have anything to fall back on. They're only thinking about the now. They're they're fighting. And spending all their money and just doing it again and again and again, you know, in, in search of, you know, nice cars or homes and that stuff's fine. But most fighters, you know, myself included early in my career, I didn't know how the hell to manage my money. And I had to learn the hard way. And um, I, I think it's a great way for you to put away money uh, long term for something that I think in the future is going to be worth a lot of money. Man, it would be nice. You know, they, they were doing those... Um fighter summits and stuff like that. They don't want to do them anymore. Like if there were people who would talk to the yeah. UFC fighters, the Bellator fighters, the PFL fighters about this stuff, uh, certainly would be nice to have a pension, right? I mean, I, I would love that for the fighters. You you put six years in the game, seven years in the organization, you get X amount, just like any other sport. Uh, but this sure. is uh, this is fascinating stuff. And Francis made some big news. There are some other guys who dabble with it. I know Olivier Aubin Mercier does as well. Yes. Um, and uh, now I sort of, I, I sort of get it. By the way, last thing before I let you go, where do you like yes. where where would I go get Bitcoin from? I know this may sound stupid, but like where do yeah. I actually get no. this? No, not at all. And that's kind of what been the confusing thing. So there's a bunch of different platforms, whether it's a Gemini, Coinbase is a big one, but they oh. kind of charge a lot of fees. The one that I, I would recommend people go to is is Swan Bitcoin. Uh, they have kind of the, the cheapest fees and they have the best deal. So I, I always go to swanbitcoin.com, but there are a bunch of different people out there or, or platforms out there where you can go and uh, and buy Bitcoin. And, you know, it's like if you have $50, $100 a week, whatever it is, a week that you feel you could put aside, like that's what I do. I just kind of do a, a weekly buy and, and um, you know, I've been accumulating little by little. And I think there's no better time than now uh, to do so. And I think you know, you look a year, five years down the line, I, I think you may be surprised by, by what you've been able to save and, and, and put away. This was so great, man. Honestly, this put me back in a whole different era. Uh, so great to talk to you. So great to see you. Happy, thrilled that you are back calling fights. Can't wait for PFL. In fact, as we were talking earlier, they announced some of those uh, fights for February 18th of their Challenger series. So we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, keep it up, man. And uh, the Anakin Florian podcast is still going strong. BattleBot's still going strong. You're still going strong, yes. Kenny. And, and I love to see it. So thank you for coming on here and educating us. And I urge everyone out there to check out the Anakin Florian podcast that you guys do a great job. Your friendship, your relationship is great as well. So um, much respect to both of you. Thank you so much for doing this, Kenny. I really appreciate it. Ariel, I appreciate it, man. And for anyone out there who, who wants to check out some jujitsu, uh, check out KennyFlorianMartialArts.com. I just released an instructional oh. uh, where, I, where I talk about jujitsu. And hopefully for those who are practitioners, um, you guys can get kind of give you a, a good roadmap uh, for, for your practice. So I love that. that okay. Sorry. I didn't know about that. And you still have the, no, the, no worries. You still have the schools, right? One in Massachusetts. I, I do. I have one. I have one in Massachusetts with my brother, Keith, and, and, yep. and that's it as of right now. All right. Much respect, Kenny. All the best to you. Thanks, and let's brother. not wait six years to do this again. All right. Let's do it again. Man. All right. Always game. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. There he is. The great Kenny Florian. What a great guy. Wow. It has been so long. UFC tonight. The last time, uh, you know, we were doing a show together. 